I'm always looking forward to these sessions, Dan. I, I hope you know I am conveying enough of how much these sessions mean to me. Thank you. I tell Angie all the time, I'm like, I feel like I'm talking to my dad somehow. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Thank you. all these valuable lessons. Now, I have a lot of ground to cover, Dan. Okay. My, my question, the personal question, uh, why... I mean, why are you gifting me your time continuously? Oh, because you asked. So that was good enough for me. Well, wow. it's just... I mean, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, I mean, if someone, if someone asks me on a podcast or helps, needs help coaching or needs help, I, I answer every email, I answer every phone call and uh, I just try to help out. It's awesome. It's an easy, it's an interesting business model. I'll tell you that mm. because mm. Uh, you would think, you would think that I would get a thousand phone calls and a thousand emails. I don't. I get very, very relatively few. Mm. Um, and and it's, it's so it's, so I don't so I don't mind it. Uh, I, in fact, I like it a lot. I and very often at the end of one of these conversations, I'll be like, Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. that's what I need. That's the cl that's the clarity that I'm missing in my own work. Wow. Um, I'm surprised sometimes how much clarity comes up in these conversations. Yeah, it's very nice. It's it's just because two right because two people come together with mm -hmm. some kind of different perspectives. I talked to a Cat's Kettlebell Dojo. She has a YouTube channel, and okay. she's from New Zealand. And we talked about the aspect of communal learning. Yeah. And she shared this with me. She was like, "That's what you're doing. You you're you're appreciating the communal learning aspect of it." And I'm getting I'm getting immensely much out of these conversations yeah. i've just said i'm having these awesome podcasts with you i have these awesome podcasts with other kettlebell folks uh, i've just had a podcast with chandler marchman one of the biggest uh, kettlebell youtube channels and we talked about almost two hours and you know the beautiful thing that i see is i always see the same some kind of you know the same uh, not maybe the same but similar perspectives on on things yeah, I mean, uh, it. I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm 64. Uh, you know, the, the there's a lot of water under my personal bridge. You know, and it uh, and I feel like if I don't start, if I don't share this information that I've kind of put cobbled together in the last 56 years of weightlifting, then it's 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 um, it's probably sinful. Sinful is a good word. Mm. Sinful. Mm. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's. Mm. You know, many of the people in the fitness industry, as they hit a certain age, they try to cash in. And when they do, they, you know, they start selling juicers or they start selling products that they never used. Or they, you know, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to I'm sell you some piece of plastic that, you know, is going to make your thighs look better or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's not that's not how I don't want my legacy to be, you know, juicing machines and, you know, thigh. And Thigh thinners and <laughs> thigh thinners. And, you know, don't, don't give them any ideas then. <laughs> and a bunch of BS supplements. You know, I want it yeah. to be. Yeah. You know. I, mm. And that's the nice thing about podcasts is there is a record, and certainly I, I doubt my my daughters will you know years from now come back and look at these. But hey, I have very very little from my mother and father, and so this would be a nice little thing to have around. I hope you know. Mm. Mm legacy legacy is very legacy important. yeah and you mentioned how people uh, jump on the any type of bandwagon to make money mm -hmm. which you know i i do understand that we all have to eat but i think there's a certain credibility that you don't want to lose a certain level of respect especially in the field of folks or experts who know stuff that you do and yeah, then you I try to Right. You try to sell or you try to go down a certain route where experts look at you like Ugh. and you mentioned it's sinful. Uh, Chandler said he says it's a responsibility to. Oh, OK. Same, right? same. So it's saying. Right. So always these similar, similar approaches. You know, um, mm. some strength coaches have died in the last decade. And, uh, you know, I, I spoke negatively, you know, and something and, and it wasn't it wasn't for public was. I spoke negatively about one of them and the person was taken, they were just shocked, aghast, if you will. And I'm like, 
no, this, all this stuff this person said is hogwash. And they, they go, well, what about this, this, and this? And I say, well, here's the problem. If you're full of crap here, I'm allowed to think you're full of crap here. Mm. Yeah. You know, uh, if you're yeah. telling me that, you know, you're going to put a magic stone on my belly and it's going to increase my bench press 10 pounds or five kilos, I'm allowed to look at the rest of your work and go, hmm, yeah, really? Mm. Really? You know, and, um, you know, I, I worry about things I write. I worry. I, I, I want to make sure they stand the test of time. You know, that's why, you know, and I get, then I get pushed back from a lot of young people. I mean, some, I've gotten two really negative uh, personal attacks on YouTube in the last week or so. And in both cases, I can guarantee the person was young and dumb, you know, um, uh, in both cases, I tried to follow up on it, but they had no YouTube account. They just had, uh, you know, when you get a, you get an account, you, you click at the private and you have nothing on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just figured that they're, they're called trolls. Trolling, and, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I and I, I, I let Sometimes. trolling bother yeah. me a little bit too. It trolling was much worse uh, in 2000, 1999. Uh, that's in the early days. Huh? Okay. Yeah, when people realized what anonymous could mean. Yeah, yeah. but then you mm. know, we all now know that anonymous doesn't. You're not as anonymous as you think. You as are, you think, right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and and I'm not gonna. But and so there's an issue, and I, I want to make sure though that. You know, um, I even I actually read the trolls and say, okay, is this a is this a valid point? Mm. You know, am I full of shit? You know, am I? The one guy said, you know, something like, you probably don't even have any legs. And I thought to myself, well, you can go to my Instagram channel and watch me Olympic lift. It's pretty sure I'm pretty sure I have legs. Mm. You know, I'm looking down at them right now. Yeah, they, yeah. they are around most definitely. May I ask, Dan, what was the second critique or the second feedback that you got? Uh, gosh, it'd be nice if I remembered. That's the problem with being, uh, you know, if you want to be remembered, if you want to be immortal, you do something great or you do something uh, horrific and there's really no middle. So mm. these trolls, mm. no one's mm. gonna, I've got a buddy who's a kind of a noted troll and he's tried to undo himself. So he's a guy that um, he used to troll. I mean, he would use his name, but he would just, you know, try to, and uh, he's actually well known in the fitness industry as being a jerk, but he's not, but he, he said things in 2002, 2003, that I guarantee you wish he wouldn't have said because people have long memories, you know? So oh, yeah. I don't remember mm -hmm. what the guy said. So Okay, oh, yeah, so uh, that's fine. Well, you know, Dan, what, what, what I think is interesting is um, you mentioned trolling and hating and, and these commentators who are, who are disrespectful. You know what the mm -hmm. ugly thing about it is that that's what I see on, especially if when things are growing, you get more and more feedback. And sure. we have 90% positive, not 95% positive feedback. But what sticks with us human beings is always the bad things. That 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 kind of makes me mad about human nature in and all by itself. We talk Arch about the, the negative trolling and we forget about the... Yeah. The hundreds of comments that are saying you're, it's life changing. I'm 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 becoming better at it and blah 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 blah. But you know, I think as a YouTuber, I and or just as a content creator, I talk to Chandler about it. Is you have these trolls, and I I got some of them. And there's one particular um, pattern that I see sometimes. Sometimes I see. I think there's even a nugget. There's a nugget of truth in even the worst comments. That's one thing that I've realized. And the other, other thing that I've realized is if there is a pattern of somebody just aiming, taking aim at you and disrespecting you in every single video and even videos where there's not a lot, you know, to even critique where you just yeah, have right, a, yeah. right? That's when people are just taking aim at you. And, and sometimes if they, are tr if they are being toxic in the comments, that's when I block them. Yeah, or sometimes... I, I it I have no be. issue blocking people. I, I don't care. I mean, mm. um, my my old boss, Archbishop George Nierauer, used to call me a prima donna because I focused on the negative reviews on things. Mm. But the the problem is, is when you're, especially when you're working with teachers, and which mm. is most of my career working with teachers, is that 
teachers uh, like to bring up the same problem over and over and over again. So mm-hmm. my thought always was, let me do is let me do my best to address this, you know, this issue. Um, well, let's move away. Let's yeah. screw them. That's yeah. enough. That's enough. <laughs> let's keep going. Uh, Dan, uh, while we are at the topic a little bit, I, I just want to, uh, I got a lot of notes, uh, as you can okay. see. So there was something going on on our YouTube channel. And a lot of our viewers were like, you have to ask Dan about it. You have to ask sure. Dan. And um, maybe you've heard about it. It, it, it made quite some rounds. This controversy from Steve Maxwell. Maybe you've heard about it. No, I know Steve. That's awesome if you didn't. Okay. So let me bring you up to speed because we're, we are looking forward to your feedback, what, what you're saying. Um, I'd like to play a clip because I want to have sure. him say the word, right? And then sure. you comment on it because it was a video that I did. So here we go. From my way of thinking now, I don't see any real reason to use kettlebells at all. I really don't. Why? And uh, I'll never use them again. And I can tell you the injuries that people have sustained. Pavel's had both elbows sur- uh, surgery. He was on the Joe Rogan show. Joe says, well, why do you only advocate two exercises? That's because that's all he can do. <laughs> Can't do anything else because his elbows are all fucked up. Dan John, I respect a lot. He's an interesting guy, but he, he's had double hip replacement surgery. The CEO of Strong First, uh, Brett Jones, has had nine knee surgeries. I mean, I can go on and on with the back surgeries and knee surgeries and, and so forth. My ex-wife. DC Maxwell, hip replacement surgery. So far, thank God, I don't have any hip surgery. But I'm loath to take advice from a guy that's had joint replacement surgery. Come on now. I mean, that's, I mean, I have been, Steve, I mean, Steve should know. I mean, if he's listened to anything I've done, I was born with a condition called pistol grip hips. Mm. Um, My niece had her first hip surgery when she was 18 months old. Danielle, my niece, has the Mm. same condition. Mm. My brother has the same condition in only one of his legs. My cousin Joey in one of his legs. And uh, it's not unusual for people in my family to have to get total hip replacements because of this, this condition called pistol grip hips. Instead of having a, instead of having a ball joint, you have more of a, it looks like that. It oh, looks wow. like that. And the day I was born, according to my doctor, I was going to have to get a total hip replacement. So I guess what, the only thing that bothers me about Steve saying that is that um, I have been more than candid. I have said this a thousand times. Everybody who spends five minutes with me knows that that's, mm-hmm. I mean, it's like, you know, I mean, see this, see that right there. See that eye? It's blue. Well, I have blue eyes and the day I was born, I had blue eyes and I've had blue eyes since the day I was born. And, uh, if Steve wants to get on me for not having brown eyes, I appreciate that too, but that's just simply DNA. Um, to be honest with you, um, Steve, bring me up like that. Um, I will use my teacher voice. I am, I am disappointed in him. I would Mm -hmm. have expected more, uh, any level of academic integrity would have had him at least ask anybody. Uh, he could ask Stu McGill because Stu knows this Stu, Stu uses me as his poster boy for what he calls the Celtic hip. Um, Mm -hmm. yeah. So, I mean, I actually take this, this is going to sound strange, Gregory, but I actually take it a little bit personally because um, this is, this is like ripping on somebody for the color of their skin or their, or, you know, maybe their issues with any issues with birth. Um, uh, I, I will upon my death, if I do go to heaven and, and if my mother and father are there, I will scold them mightily for giving me this gift. And I'll tell them that Steve Maxwell is very angry with them. Um, I'm sure that's what's going to happen. Then you know, I, I, I don't mean to stir up the pot. No, I hope, I hope, but it's, you know, he said it and, you know, he said it in a, when you listen to the video, I can send it to you afterwards. And maybe if you have time, you can, but he said it in a condescending manner about Pavel. And he said about you, he said, Dan John, I quote, he said, Dan John, I respect the man but he had hip replacement. So conveying the idea, the kettlebells lead oh, to problems, yeah, you see? So, so what is no, your no, take no. on and I, my, my point in, uh, is that 
this is we don't need to discuss this anymore because right. he is um you know let's like the basketball players i work with that are well over two meters tall um the reason many people in, who want to play basketball don't play basketball is because they're way under two meters tall mm -hmm. so i mean if you're a little white kid from salt lake city who's this tall and you want to play professional basketball ain't gonna happen because you're not tall enough and you, you might not be playing it with uh, good enough people and that's just so i'm not going to blame a kid for not being tall enough but mm -hmm. you know let 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 him let him do whatever he wants to do i mean um i we have different lifestyles uh the two of us and different mm -hmm. views on things um i'm always reticent to publicly call someone out um and, and and if I do, Gregory, if you ever hear me do name a name, mm. let me know because that's that's not that's not the way I would do things. Mm. Okay. Um, well, and in yeah. fact, as I understand it, Steve comes from the martial arts background, right? You know, I don't know very much about Steve. What I know, okay. or, well, or what it seems to be, is that he was, and that's what I'm. Maybe we can segue into that he was a pivotal in in you know bringing up kettlebells at the time of RKC and mm -hmm. so and that's maybe you can take us down if you want to memory lane of Steve Maxwell, Pavel, RKC, Strong First, you, Steve, oh, yeah, Carter yeah. Well, and you know. because just just as a small side note, I mean, Steve Carter is my mentor and I talked to him about it uh, for a short moment and um, he wants to share his side of things and uh, he's coming on the podcast uh, and, and Steve was so pivotal in my coaching career, but I'm so young and I don't know. Yeah, I don't know how it went down so, back then. Steve, so. Steve was at my gym. Uh, year, it's been a while now, but he was at uh, he was at my gym years ago. We did a he did a workshop. Steve, uh, Steve Carter. Yeah, um, yeah, awesome. And Steve Maxwell is the one that really actually without I asked him um, one time, and he went over basically three uh, mobility movements that I should do with the kettlebell. That was Steve mm -hmm. Maxwell that were just very helpful for my, I competed in a thing called the weight pentathlon. That's the shot put discus javelin hammer and 35, 16 kilo weight throw. Mm. My weak point was the javelin and I got good coaching, Bill Witt, thank you, Bill. And then I took Steve Maxwell's advice on some uh, kettlebell flexibility mo mobility moves. And I increased my personal record, uh, well, about 25 meters. Wow. Yeah, well, in the jab, that, I sucked in the jab. And so when you mm -hmm. add 25 meters to suck, it just merely brings you up to crappy. So, uh, but, uh, and, and so I was very, I'm very grateful for his time. And I, and I thought his work uh, early, it, it, but I've noticed this now with a lot of people in the kettlebell world who come from the martial arts tradition. In the martial arts tradition, you're supposed to really revere and respect your mentors. But very mm -hmm. often the, those who come from martial arts to get into kettlebells it's like they do the exact opposite now listen love pavel or hate pavel you i mean he put together the work dragon door did so okay so a buddy of mine went to pavel's 25 dollar 20 or 25 dollar workshop on strength at that same workshop in in minnesota was john duquesne after mm -hmm. the the workshop John invited Pavel out for coffee and the two of them started talking about things and they came up with this very brilliant idea. John had a, John had a, a, a site called Dragon Door that was kind of a martial arts specialty shop. Well, they would, they would get kettlebells and they would write articles on things. Well, and that started the modern kettlebell revolution. And by the way, shut up if anyone disagrees with me. I know the history of this stuff probably better I mean, there's a few people around the world who know uh, Jan Dillinger, maybe, uh, maybe uh, 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 Jan Todd down there at uh, University of Texas in the Stark Center. But honestly, I would put myself in the top five of people who know this stuff. Um, yes, kettlebells were around um, into the mid 60s with Soviet track and field. Uh, they showed up in 1974 at the College of San Mateo with the uh, Soviet hammer throwers training with them. Uh, in, in the states right so yeah. uh, kettlebells uh, san, mateo, were, yeah. san mateo california yeah okay, and the, okay. The, i watched the soviet throwers uh yuri tom i think it was 
it, it might have been another one, but I'm almost sure it's Yuri Tom. And he did all these various throws with the kettlebell. And then that would have been 1974. Ooh, sorry. That'd be my, maybe 77 in this example. Mm -hmm. it, I saw him twice. So, it, you know, and then uh, we're talking 20 something years later, they reintroduced the kettlebell. Um, the original stuff, I mean, the original kettlebell training was bent presses and snatches. That was, you were, those were the two lifts that they, that everyone was doing. Yeah. And it's, it makes me, still makes me laugh about who in the hell does bent presses bent press yeah. <laughs> very or, very skilled and tricky exercise. well it's also i just I mean, who, yeah <laughs> who cares i mean it's just like on the list of who cares exercise I teach it, <laughs> on the I list of who cares exercises um, i like that one okay you know it's uh mm. and um so just to, just to reiterate uh, dan so i can follow you um you have watched kettlebells pop up in your mm -hmm. in your world and your journey of of mm -hmm of uh and athletics up here, right up here in these magazines i have some 1950s and 1960s articles with about kettlebells but you wouldn't recognize any of it uh for arm wrestling they have wow. one where you put wow you arm wrestle mm. they do a lot of one finger lifting with them uh the the presses are unrecognizable the presses are basically you hold the bell on your shoulder and you press up overhead mm. There is a That's lot. That's actually I saw I saw an old Soviet video on YouTube where you see some Russian soldiers sh soldiers, if it is accurate, pressing exactly like this. Yeah. What, what you oh, and by the way, and I'm absolutely fine when people pull out those old videos, but please, I mean, I can pull out American World War II videos of guys doing clean and press with 30 pounds. And we've come a long way, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And my point is, yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. My dad talked about lifting. Um, these basically, I mean, these were, I mean, I don't know if there was, it was just one step from, you know, sticks with heavy dirt on them, you know, <laughs> getting ready for uh, World War II. Mm. And, but, you know, like he told me the weights were 20, 25, 30 pounds or nothing. I mean, I'm not going to go back to the 1941 United States Army preparation program to throw the discus in 2021. You know, I'm, yeah. I, I, no, you With can't progress, convince right? me. Progression. You can't yeah. convince me to do that. I mean, mm. the thing mm. in my what I learned from Brett Jones when I took the cert was that the kettlebell. Okay, you can find things that are heavier. You can find things that are more adaptable, but to teach the fundamental human movements, I think the kettlebell is king. Wow. The, learning the hinge. Yeah, yeah. With the kettlebell is far better than learning the hinge with the barbell. Mm. because you can mm. reach between the legs with ballistic load mm. uh the, the wow. goblet squat most considered the most important invention in the history of weightlifting gregory who who invented the goblet squat i think a gentleman that i'm talking to right now there you go uh, <laughs> you know doing half if, if you did kettlebell swings goblet squats and half kneeling presses you know you pretty much cover about everything you're going to need and throw in a suitcase carry from the so put it in the trunk of your car, do a suitcase carry, you know, uh, three kilometers out onto a field, do 500 kettlebell swings, do 100 uh, goblet squats, do 50 presses, uh, both hands, uh, half kneeling, walk back to the car with the other hand. Yeah, that's a good workout. I don't care who yeah, you are. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah. So uh, you saw it pop up, right? So the kettlebells yeah. were around and... and, well, and, and the With best the... thing was was the forum at Dragon Door, the early forum. They had a whole bunch. I mean, they had some trolls and all, you know, and there was some, there were some issues. But it was a brilliant forum. And when the books would come out, uh, they would the books would sell themselves because of all the positive reviews in the forum. And then the follow up questions. And then Pavel would come in. Pavel's original place he hung out was called Amaros. Uh, America, um, it's the Z, the Z system that Russian uh, Z system, Zevroided Dan or something like that. I, I, I'm sorry, but Pavel's posts on Amaros, which I have somewhere in my notes, are just absolutely, I think, some of his best work. And then, of course, Pavel at the time was uh, writing articles for a magazine called Muscle Media 2000. Hmm. which later became testosterone nation teen nation, nation. Uh, wow yeah mm. so he wrote for the original um everything so connected. he would mm. oh everything's connected wow. uh in fact muscle media 2000 probably is the 
I would say maybe one of the better magazines of all time. This is where the uh, Ori Hoffelmecker uh, published the Warrior Diet for the first time, mm -hmm. which is you know a twenty-hour fast, four-hour <laughs> feed. Mm -hmm. This is where De Pasquale published the Anabolic Diet, which is basically five days of zero carb, two days of you know, big time yeah, carbon. Loading, yeah. Mm -hmm. Whew, I tell you, I love mm. that diet. Whoa. Mm. Probably the best diet I've ever done for a uh, explosive athlete. Mm. Uh, yeah. You want to compete by the day as a thrower on day five of the zero carbs. Wow. Cause you're in a shitty mood. You're pissed off. You're angry. <laughs> uh, and then mm. after the meet, you go drink beer and eat pizza and you're like, coach, I love you, man. I just love that. <laughs> And just as a, side, as a side note, Dan, I've talked to uh, Chandler. We talked about the Olympics and we both had a sense of revere for the coaches preparing the athletes to perform on day one. Right. So I think that's such a powerful concept that, that is often overlooked because you see the numbers of the athlete. But the coach who is molding that person to function at its best on a given specific day in a macro or micro cycle is just overwhelmingly powerful. I, I don't think it's the physical preparation. It, it's all the mental preparation. Mm. Uh, I think physical peaking is completely overrated and mental mm. peaking is completely underrated. Wow. Um, you know, when you watch Valerie Allman, she makes that, uh, she's a gold medalist in, in the women's discus. Her first throw is an absolute bomb of a throw. She just destroys a competition on throw number one. And then there's two, I think there's two rain delays after. She slips in the ring twice. And then I think it's round five, maybe. She has another massive bomb to just completely, I mean, it's over. Uh, Krauser in the men's shot put, you know, he opens with an Olympic record, you know, oh. obviously. You know, <laughs> and then I think he had oh. what, six? I, I could be wrong, but I think it's six for six, all new Olympic records, but you're right. But, but that's not whether he did five sets of two or five sets of three, that's the mental preparation. Mm. You know, um, one of the things my athletes hated early in the careers, I made them throw in snow and rain and with, we used to train on asphalt, wet shoes, their feet getting frozen. But when the state track meet is in a rainstorm, they had, Oh, you know, they were ready. For oh, it. and you, and you bring up, you. I've I've tagged oh, you in not, that story. Uh, we, hold on, uh, we still got plenty to go on that story. Yeah, go just ahead. just a go small ahead. side note from there where I've tagged yeah. you in that story because you talked about how to prepare because pre preparing for whether it's a rain or or storm uh -huh. or whatever, and I've tagged you in the story about the penalty shootouts in the European Championships that you've mentioned where you said I would make sure to have all my athletes, all my, my soccer players line up and be safe in that penalty shootout because if it goes down, it goes down and it happened. So it, the, the losing team looked like they were unprepared yeah. and the winning, it's what you've mentioned, Dan. I, I, it struck me. I was like, I've talked to Dan about this. We're just dedicating a small portion of the session to penalty shootouts. And so many games ended yeah. up in penalty shootouts. Well, in fact, I would Prophecy. probably have, I would probably keep a third uh, goalie whose job it was. I mean, seriously, I'd hire someone. I don't care what the price is. The third goalie, he's not going to suit up for games. His job would be to study my guys my penalty shooter and then try to, and then when we have this daily, mm. I would do it daily. This goalie mm. would come in every day with a different game plan mm. to deal with the shootout. Yeah. It's, because. Wow. So this was that's, a powerful that's, that's lesson then. <laughs> it's what I call so invest wisely and yeah. asymmetrical risks. Risks. Yeah. And uh, you know, American football, if it goes to overtime, this is actually a kind of a funny story when I, when I coached, um, we went into overtime against the team and we weren't a very good team. Uh, and this is 1980, this would be 1987. So it was a while ago and we weren't good. So we lost the first five games and we lost, we won the last five games, four in a row overtimes. Mm. So we're in the overtime against West and they win the toss and they go in and score and they start celebrating. And my athletes look at me like, and I go, they don't know the rules of overtime. 
They think mm. they've won the game. It's done. Oh, and then they have to get back. So I run my team on the field while they're celebrating. They're not, they don't line up. They have to take a timeout, reset. We score. Yeah. We score. We go into the second overtime. We stop them on. So on first down, since you, since we stopped them, we lined up for a, a field goal on first down and their coach is going, it's a fake. It's a fake. Don't rush them. Well, we don't, we don't handle the ball very well. So the, mm. the, 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 hand, the holder has to go, oh, 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 oh. put it down like this. The kicker <laughs> steps up and kicks it through. If they would have rushed one guy, they would have blocked it. Mm. But he didn't know the rules of overtime. The referee goes like this, game's over. We rush on the field, and their co head coach is going, it's our turn. It's our turn. And and my co my athletes and uh, the, the refs are looking at him like, do you even – he had he never, understand the rules. He didn't know the rules wow, of because, overtime because he probably never played in overtime or didn't, rarely or whatever. Didn't. Yeah. So I used to have wow. a drill where I would practice. What do we do if the starting quarterback gets hurt? Quarterback in American football, very important. Yep, position. Yeah. Yeah. So important. we had a drill where you know I'd have Gregory. Okay, Gregory, it's your it's your hamstring. Walk off of the hurt hamstring. And so you'd pretend like you have a hurt yeah, hamstring. Yeah. yeah. I would turn to the backup quarterback and say, okay. And we had a very safe play to run. He would run on the field. We get the quarterback off it because, and guess what happens? Mm. You're going to have a quarterback get hurt. Yeah. It's going to, it's going to happen. So maybe, mm. so you got to practice those, things. that those asymmetrical risks. And you know, the beautiful thing about the penalty shootout, and then we can jump back to the story yeah, because sure. I'm so interested. But the beautiful thing about the penalty shootout, somebody shared a play of football. And I think it was an important game. I can't remember it, but I'm just uh, paraphrasing. And he shared this with me because I put this in the story. And he was like, wow, it's a, the same moment where one team was just having, I think there were a few meters in front of the line. It was just uh, a few and it's done. And they played, I think they had a very safe play, but the guy who intercepted the ball from the, op 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 from the opposing team studied that exact play for so many times that he was able to intercept it. He saw it. Uh, he saw it. Yeah, it's the uh, New England Patriots against yeah, the yeah, Seattle yeah, Seahawks. Yeah. That's it. Exactly. And Belichick, and Belichick told the, the nickelback the day before the game, they like to throw a slant ah. on the goal line. There you go. And wow. See? And, wow. And here's the funny thing. He said, go practice it. And they did. And that's the difference. Uh, wow. You know, it's attention, you know, uh, in uh, the one of the words we use a lot in America is attention to detail. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if wow. you're a kettlebell instructor, attention to detail mm. uh, is the reason I don't have many people swing is they don't they don't hinge correctly. Mm -hmm. And if you don't hinge correctly, uh, mm -hmm. you can't swing. It's and by the way, that's not a detail. That's that's, that's freaking the fundamental way fundamental movement pattern. Yeah, yeah. but <laughs> yes. So there, so it's that attention to detail that is mm. the key to yeah. to um, really being a coach. Yeah, yeah. And you yeah. had you had a beautiful Instagram post about it where you had two guys. Guys, this is a hinge. This is a squat. Yeah, know the difference. Yeah, that's it's, how I start my certs uh, and basics, or my workshops. Man. I always mm. that's. Yeah. And then there's only that's only the one drill, but we build up from that drill. We start on the knees. We go to, mm. you know, we just we do a lot of things. Mm. But if if you don't, if you I want you sitting in a chair looking at this demonstration. And if you can't intellectually explain the difference between a hinge and a squat to me after that, you can't be in the cert anymore. Mm. It's mm. that crucial. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's it's fundamental. It, and did you notice had plates on their feet? Uh, one of them. Uh, both. Uh, both had plates on their feet. So for the Ankle? for the hinge, for the hinge, you put them mm -hmm. on the toes, mm -hmm. and for the squat, you put uh, weights under the heel. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. The wedge where you automatically so, move into a hinge, and and the plate yeah. for better mm -hmm. ankle mobility. That's yeah. It's good stuff. Well, yeah. One of the things I try to do at workshops is when I teach the hinge first. First, I take the knees and the ankles and the feet out. Then I take the ankles and the feet out. And then I take the ankles out. And then we try to hinge. And mm -hmm. by the way, 
you constantly have to keep going back to square one, you know, start, you know, you have to go back to one constantly. <laughs> and now that you mention it, uh, I've talked to Angie and uh, I told her, I said, listen, you know what we have to do in our, in our warm up now, because she had a session recently and they, I think it was a swing or something. And she mm -hmm. was like, hinge guys, watch the hinge. And then she stopped everything. So I was like, okay guys, now stand up and show me a hinge. And we have, uh, clients who have been working us for a long time, but sometimes they they miss it and it's like they don't remember what a hinge is Even though we talk about it regularly and then I told her you know what we're gonna do in every warm-up session in every mo mobility warm-up session in the middle we put the hinge in the middle just right. give me a few hinges Yeah, coming back down and boom up with a little bit of explosive power tension your abs coming back just to understand and yeah. drill this into your brain and now we think it, because you say com coming back to, to square one is building the hinge into the mobility workout uh, or the warm-up because it's yeah, so we crucial. Did, uh, so today we did uh, today was a gent an easy day so it was a tonic workout and walking but we worked on the hinge as part of our our mobility work because mm. The best way to stre stretch the hamstrings is mm. through hinging, mm -hmm. not, you know, the other ways. Yeah. Mm. And there, there isn't even a German word for it, you know? That's so crazy. Uh, there is. I squat. Guarantee. You know, hinge means scharnier in, in German. And squat is kniebeuge in German. Press is drücken in German. But hinge, the word hinge, you don't have a proper um, translation in German okay. for the hinge. So on the door, the thing that holds the door to the wall, what is that yeah. called? Charnier. Nobody says do a charnier. Nobody says this. But that's, so the word charnier and the word hinge and the word cardinal, cardinal? Cardinal? Yeah, like cardinal, the Catholic church. Ah, uh, cardinal, yes. Cardinal. Uh, cardinal, uh, it's the same. The cardinal virtues, the cardinal virtues. Yeah. yeah. Those all mean hinge. Mm, okay. Because those are the, so that's the idea that yeah. they are. I mean, there is, you, you have the proper translation, the hinge at the door, Shania in the Türe. Yeah, we got it. But when we talk about the movement pattern going to a hinge, there isn't a, I, I have to look it up again, but there isn't a proper trans, translation well, for it. Because hinge is a, hinge it is so is fundamental. Even, it is well, so fundamental. Even, but I doubt it's older than much more than two decades. Which is so crazy, isn't it? It, it? it is so essential for people to understand. And yet we have coaches who don't understand what a hinge is. Well, because it's like I said, it's probably 20, 25 wow. years old. Yeah. At most. Mm. Um, I'm glad I picked it up. <laughs> uh, you know, basically, so, I was always taught push your butt back, push yep. your butt back, mm. which is fine. Except the idea is get yourself in that position. Of yeah, because if your upper body doesn't move forward, you lose balance. So you have yeah. to understand. So then, the, the memory lane trip. Ah, John yeah. Duquesne, now Strong First, uh, not, uh, RKC Dragon Door, and your involvement, and Steve Maxwell's involvement, if we well, could. My involvement came in, you know, my involvement kind of came in sideways. Um, oh, well, my involvement really, really happened is when Charles Staley had his boot camp and I met Pavel, and Pavel and I spent hours that day just talking strength. I mean, my brother Gary was just amazed. He, my brother Gary came down as my guest and Pavel and I talked for hours. And then Pavel said, we got to get you involved. And I said, well, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm 365 busy right now. Cause I was a, you know, head strength coach, head track coach, yeah, yeah. Uh, school teacher, two kids I had it going yeah. on. So when they had their convention, I went down, I had a track meet that weekend in Las Vegas. I had a weight pentathlon down in Las Vegas. And so I went over and to their convention and I spoke and that's when I met Steve Maxwell and all the others. Because they uh, were was, there, right? They were all there mm -hmm. and it was a great thing. And that's where I got my first kettlebell. I took second in the kettlebell weight for distance. My friend Dan beat me, but I got a 28 kilo bell out of it. And that was my only kettlebell for years. And then uh, I finally was able to break away in 2007 to go to the cert in San Jose. Frankly, uh, it's the worst cert I've ever been to in my life. It was very bad. And the nice thing is I wrote extensively uh, to John Duquesne and Pavel about how to improve it. I wasn't, I wasn't being mean. I was being professional. Mm. And uh, that's, when I taught, right? mm. that's when I taught the goblet squat for the first time in that kind of. 
And within about a week, they had put the goblet squat into the curriculum. So the goblet squat wasn't part of the curriculum until I taught it at my own cert. Mm. And uh, I, yeah, the way they taught the squat was just horrific. So anybody who, uh, anybody before, anybody who ever critiques me on the squat in kettlebells really should maybe hold off a little bit. Mm. And then uh, the next time I went down, I was a, an assistant at UCLA. And then I became a team leader at the next one. And then I became a senior and then a master. Uh, that was, it all happened very quickly because uh, I mean, I'm not being full of myself, but I can coach. Yeah, of, of course. No, if, if if you have if you have somebody stepping in where you know uh, it comes with a huge background, you don't have to yeah. play the full game. It's it's clear yeah. that you have yeah. to have this person involved. This is this normal. So, um, Steve Maxwell was also involved. Steve Carter told me that he was the head coach or that he was doing the the certs as well as a yeah. as a master coach, right? Master. So. That was the RKC movement, right? Uh -huh. So, then, what happened? If you if you, you can't talk about Steve, it, Steve, uh, I just it, it kind of happened. So Jeff Martone was doing workshops for CrossFit, and I yeah, Martone. And I yeah. guess and I guess mm. Jeff said something along the lines of, "It doesn't matter what kind of kettlebell you use," but and then it got wind, and they got really angry, and they fired Jeff, which worked out great for Jeff financially. Uh, wait, he, he, what did he say, Jeff? Uh, I mean, Jeff Martone, right? The guy who was doing some CrossFit stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the kettlebell sport guy. Yeah. Yeah. What What happened is he wasn't using official. They weren't using official RKC kettlebells, uh, okay. which is interesting because a, about a year later, I was given a workshop with very famous people, and uh, and I wasn't going to do it because they didn't have RKC kettlebells. And uh, I got a, an email from someone very famous in kettlebells. It doesn't matter. Go do the workshop. So they went from it has to be RKC only kettlebells to it doesn't matter in about one year. Okay. Then something happened. I think it had to have been financial. Sometimes I, I we used to call it the Saturday Night Massacre, but that's when Steve Cotter, Steve, Steve Cotter, Steve Maxwell, um, the guy who's the the vegan, uh, Mike Mahler. Uh, and then the guy that was into uh, military applications, I don't remember his name, sorry. They all quit one day. Oh, and, they, and then they went off and started their own little, uh, and they sent me the DVD. And honestly, I watched it. And I, I, of course, you know, sometimes DVDs can be brutal. I mean, watching someone do a workshop is can be brutal. And it was, hmm. I mean, it was, it was fine. I mean, it was fine. It's just, I, they kept saying how different things were going and I couldn't see any difference and I'm not being a jerk. I just sometimes, sometimes when someone says, well, I do this instead of this. And I, I just frankly can't see any difference. It's not, I'm not stupid. I just mm. don't know why I'm mm. not going to pick a fight over some nuance, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so they all quit these guys, right? That you mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And you can ask Steve more about it. Though I doubt Steve would want to talk about it. It's, you know, it's the dark. Oh, he mentioned, important. yeah, he mentioned, he mentioned it that he won't be, and we want to talk about it because he oh. said, listen, times, times have changed, he says. And uh, yes, he had some quarrels with, with, with Pavel and stuff, but times, yeah, it's, it's been a long time and he wants to talk about it and he doesn't hold grudges. So, but, but it's still for us, you know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm the younger generation. So for me, this is so highly interesting, not because it's bad bl blood between you guys, but it's because it's so interesting as to why people have split. I, I mean, if you live life long enough, you see when you put more than two people together, there's always some rubbing. No, there's on, always, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. And but, then, uh, yeah. Uh, the second split uh, is when we we're riding easy strength, uh, Pavel and I. And uh, John and Pavel were having more. They, they were they were bumping heads about it. Just John about every, yeah mm. and I, I don't i only know the story from you know i just know the story how it impacted me and and the book i was writing um but uh you know pa i was with pavel when he uh, we were doing a workshop for the military together when he showed me all the strong first stuff and frankly i've never understood why the split was necessary i thought things could have been done um there's a lot of things about the rkc that went downhill almost immediately uh, but a lot of, and then things got better and were, and then it was strong first, um, you know, uh, strong first has had its issues. They've done a few things. And what I mean, politically, I mean, actual American politics. They, uh, um, they, they, 
they did this thing about a year ago that got a lot of bad press to the point that I was asked to respond to it. And I'm like, I don't want to talk about this, but mm-hmm. I did. Yeah. It was the, yeah, the summer last summer, you know, before the election, you know, ah, some stuff came up. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, some political, really political stuff, right? Truly okay. political. And the, you know, uh, you know, there's still there's still a lot of issues that in that both organizations I think still need to address better. I think the role of women in both our organizations is still it, it, it seems to be coming around a little in a little bit better direction to me. Mm-hmm. But there there'll be times I'll hear and read things and be like, oh dear God, is mm-hmm. this 1962? Is this you know Mad Men? Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't like uh, I don't you know I don't I, one of my knocks on the workout that shall not be named is the way the founder would talk about, you know, my women can beat your men. I, I just don't feel ever mm. that that's, a, mm. that's just not a place I want to be in in 2021. Mm. At, yep. and, I, and mostly it's at my age, I don't think it's a pro- Just generally, right? Yeah. Generally. I'm not a fan of, I'm mm. not a fan of sexism, racism. I'm not, a, I'm not a fan of those kinds of things. And I, and it's hard for me to be around it. Um, yeah. So and I, I'm when, you know, when you look, when I look as a, as a European, to American politics that we always see swap over, just a small side note, that we sometimes see swap over to the to Europe is how, I just re- heard, heard it, I think it was a statistic that the word sexist and racist uh, came up in usage about 500% in the last five years. Yeah, oh yeah. And, and it's, it's like everything revol- revolves around this. And I even felt this on our YouTube channel in some areas where I, just responded very neutral, but it's not the topic that that we're focused on. We're focused on kettlebells. We're focused on help, helping people. Schuster yeah, bleibt yeah. bei deinen Leisen, the German word, where, where this expression, where like, you got to stick to what you know, because that stay, works yeah. best. The joke here in the States is stay in your lane. Bro. Stay in your lane, yeah, <laughs> which is awesome. So Pavel left RKC to really build his own thing, mm-hmm. probably, right? Yeah. So and, that's when uh, the split happened. Right. Yeah, mm-hmm. and uh, my good friend Mark Toomey uh, became his CEO, and and I was with Mark. I did a I did a, a I've done two big ones for Mark. Um, so I got a call eight days out to do a RKC two in Belfast, Ireland, oh, Northern wow. Ireland, mm. and uh, eight days. Uh, not many people in this Oof. world can Oof. do a, an advanced kettlebell cert uh, halfway across the world mm. in an eight day period. <laughs> And then I did another. I did another event for him that actually worked out personally very nicely for me. Uh, Mark uh, Mark asked me to be the master at a cert in England, and that worked out great because my daughter was uh, studying over in Spain at the time, so she mm. flew over wow. and uh, did awesome. the cert with me, which was just a delight. Awesome, yeah. And uh, that's actually, yeah, it was interesting because uh, Mark finally had to go over and. Uh, tell one of the assistants to stop it was i tell my assistants all the time i don't want to i'll stop that story because that'll get negative but uh i always tell my assistants at at certs unless you can say something with absolute clarity don't say anything Mm -hmm. and i start always with concept i i I have a very simple system okay Mm -hmm. it's called concept concept drill frankenstein's monster okay Mm -hmm. so the swing is a hinge, the clean is a hinge, the snatch is a hinge. Okay, the concept is hinge, 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 hinge. Yes, yes, okay. sir. Uh, I think, Gregory, you're squatting on that. Oh, am I? Yeah, you need to hinge. If that concept doesn't fix, in the goblet squat, at the bottom, you push your knees out with your elbows. That's That, to me, is more of a concept. If that doesn't work, then we go to drills drills yeah to get the then feeling. okay so mm-hmm. you're not hinging so i'll put your mm-hmm. toes up on a, on, on a board mm-hmm. yeah, so on that'll board. take wow, your awesome. ankles out of it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so now we're going to do uh yeah. swings with your toes up on a board mm-hmm. now you're hinging you reach down and go oh my god my hamstrings are killing me already mm-hmm. good mm-hmm. that's a hinge if mm-hmm. that doesn't work then we move to frankenstein's monster it's your ankle it's your knee it's your butt it's your hamstrings if you use any term in anatomy, that's the third step. And, and so I, uh, now I uh-huh. said, put your yeah. toes up. So yeah. I said, yeah. put your toes up, yeah. but I didn't tell you I was taking your ankles out of it. 
Yeah. I just said yeah. I'm putting just your toes sim- in. Sim- keep it simple, stupid, right? I, so, I love it. Kiss. concept, this is a squat, this is a hinge, we're doing hinges. Yeah. Okay, that yeah. wasn't a hinge. Yeah. Oh, do it again. Okay, okay. Yeah. That doesn't yeah. work, drills. Mm-hmm. And I've got a whole boatload of drills. Mm-hmm. That doesn't work. Then I fold my arms and go, oh, here it comes, your ankle. And then very often you find out that, oh, I, I broke my ankle skiing last year. You think that's the issue? Mm. Why don't you say something earlier, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, if I may paraphrase it to get a better understanding. So the first idea is, listen, we talk about the idea of the movement, right? Because you have to get an idea to, to yeah, visualize yeah. it. Yeah. Then if you don't understand it, we have to maybe make you feel it to understand it. Well, and here's the thing, though. You're going to have people who squat perfectly the first time. Yeah. Yeah. We see that as well. Boom. So here's the thing. Shut up. Yeah. It's, 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 it's good. It's safe. You're good. You're safe. Move on. So then, so they've mastered the the two hand swing. Move on to the one hand. You're done. Yeah. We see this as well. We have some naturally gifted kinesthetic sense folks who are just, it's boom. It's, uh, you got it. Boom. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so the last resort will be okay now we talk about the details where it gets a little fuzzy with the biological terms and then you got right so that's that's the idea right am i getting it correctly that's yeah and and you can see a crappy first off you see a crappy coach because they coach crappy coach two things crappy coaches number one they coach while the athlete is in movement Mm -hmm. so really i talk about cueing so stay tall squeeze yeah, uh, that's cueing. That's just cueing. go, 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 go. Good job. Good, go, go, yeah. go. I, le- I learned that distinction. Yeah. I Coaching well. is when you talk about things to the yeah. athlete. Yeah. So you, rule yeah. number one, never coach while the athlete is in move. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I don't even count. I don't even like to count reps for them because I feel that's coaching. That's why we use for time. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And number two. Yeah. Awesome. Number two, mm-hmm. the second mistake is bringing up anatomy too soon. If you tell, so humans have our eyes here because we're hunters. So if I say like you have gluteal amnesia as a human, you're not necessarily going to do this. (laughs) What? (laughs) But your mind is. Yeah. Yeah. Your mind is going to be looking behind you to go, wait, something's wrong back there. You know, if I say, if I walk up behind any human and scream loudly, the rea- reaction of a human, yes, my I'm going to be running away, but I'm going to also fight or flight the situation. Mm-hmm. I'm going to look back. Mm-hmm. So the second I mm-hmm. say your tibialis is rotating counteractually to the frontal plane, mm-hmm. as you, first off, I'm going to say you're fired. But secondly, <laughs> yes. I'm going to say, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Frankenstein's monster is the last thing I want wow. you to do. Wow, that's powerful. And that's something that I had to learn, the cueing and stopping the coaching. And we, we recently had it in a session where one of our clients was doing, I don't know what it was. Uh, I think it was a swing. And then she started talking. She was like, yeah, yeah, right. I'm doing it wrong. I'm not, st- keep, just keep going, keep going. We'll talk about it afterwards. Keep going, keep yeah. going. And then you stop stay them. Yeah, stay, yeah, that's it. Now, awesome. this, in fact, I learned to do this, okay? Watch my hand, put the weight down. Put the weight down. All right, that's yeah. okay. Now let's talk. Mm. Yeah, you know you're not. And and here's what I usually say: you're not doing swings for a while. You're gonna do, and then we regress them. Yeah, yeah, and, and see see what we're. That's awesome. And I just and I want. I used to be a lot kinder about that. Now I'm much more. No, you're done. You're done. That you look. That looks terrible. Hmm. It's kinder to do that than it is to let them deal with a back injury. Uh, yeah. Even if it's something as simple as a spinal erector pull, which is pretty fixable. It's a pulled mm-hmm. muscle. Mm-hmm. But if you've ever had a spinal erector injury, it's five or six days of constipation, crappy night sleeps. Um, you, you, you look terrible because you're not sleeping. Mm. You have to, you have to hold your leg while you sleep. Oh, it's terrible. Mm. I don't want you to go through that. Mm. <laughs> yeah. It's like you say, a, a, a a good coach gives you what you want, but he also gives you what you need. Mm-hmm. So sometimes the, the coach has to tell you something that you might. And we, just a small uh, example. One of our clients, she 
She had an intense program. She had a massive success. She lost about 30 pounds. It was awesome, powerful. Then we talked about uh, the continuation of the program just with some group training, which was once a week. So she, she, uh, she switched from three times per week down to one per week. And then she didn't show up for the first week, the second week, the third week. And then the fourth week, I told her, um, I don't know if this is apparent, but you didn't show up for the last month. And that, that hit her. It was like, what? Four weeks? Yeah. Time passes quickly, right? Oh. And she immediately came back. So, yeah, it's, mm. yeah, it, it, it's, it's beautiful stuff. Uh, hey, uh, I don't want to brag, but I, I just finished Rusty Moore's uh, uh, Visual Impact. And I'm, since January 1st, I'm down 16 kilos now. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome, well, it's for weightlifting, man. but I tell you, I do feel better. You know, and, I and do feel better. You plan to keep it that way? Oh yeah. Well, um, I mean, Leah, may Leah. I ask, may I ask then what is your, because that's, that's what I'm asking some of our clients sometimes. And I wonder what your response is. What is your natural tendencies? I feel I'm lean athletic. That's my thing. I'll never be big, never be like this. What's in your case? I like to beat people. <laughs> okay. No, Just, I thought okay. I wasn't joking. I, I like to win. Uh, so, All right. I like to throw things far. I like mm. to lift weights and I'm just, uh, but for me right now, the most important thing and, uh, upstairs I got Leo and he's four months old and he's doing great. And then, uh, not far from here, I have Danny and Josephine and, uh, I want to be around a little bit for my grandkids life. And if I, you know, uh, just this week we lost another, uh, bodybuilder oh, no. yeah. uh, and, uh, author he was 49 and this is this is so sad this is and that's tragedy. not something i want to do you know i i know my family years. i i know in my family don't live long but i know what uh if i weigh 115 kilos i'm not going to live as long as i if i weigh like i do 99 you know 98 which is sometimes like having to in your case now setting listen i have other priorities that are more important so yeah well, I mean, I, I want to lift as a 96K lifter. I think I told you last time that my, my coach, Dave Turner, went through the all the Utah State records. So, you know, I mean, so we keep changing weight classes. So we have multiple records. Mm -hmm. And he went through and he added up who had the most uh, state records. And it's me. But awesome. here's the interesting thing he said. If he added up the second, third, and fourth people combined, I still have more state records than wow. they Wow. So specimen so no i'm just a it means hard working like, specimen that that's what it is right and uh you know come january i'll be in a, i'll be in a new age group again which means i get a chance you know in my first meets to break state records again yeah, and i know awesome. it sounds silly but you know um how many 64 year olds still are trying to figure out why they can't snatch 90 kilos in a workout you know, I'm like, I'm sitting around this last couple of weeks. What is wrong with my technique? You know, I'm missing, I'm missing stuff out front. I mean, that's many 64 year olds are worrying about, you know, getting yeah. out of bed in the morning. They, and I'm they, yeah. worried about why yeah. all of a sudden I can't snatch 90 anymore. Mm. You know, you know, just investing. Yeah. Investing. In, and that's what I do then. You know, I, I see a lot of great examples. My father's one of them mm -hmm. just to, just to keep, keep moving keep moving, keep moving, make sure you, you never lose sight of what's important, even when priorities switch and, and, you know, take care of what you have so that, you know, when you get a little bit older, this John Meadows thing, this, it hits me hard because it's 49. That's not even half of your lifespan, so to speak. Yeah. And, and, and that's, that, that's a tragedy. And, Mm -hmm. And it's fitness, health related, right? It's but he had some issues with his health. I uh, heard a doctor talk about it, and oh. but it's it's just sad. It's yeah, and it's a horrific. rare it's a rare week or month I don't lose somebody and, and that I competed against her. Mm, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm going. My uh, elementary school is having a reunion, and you know you go through the list of my classmates who are dead. Elementary school that's up to eighth grade, so about when you're mm -hmm. twelve or so. Mm -hmm. And my class, we, we meet every couple of years. It's wonderful. And, uh, you know, just read that list of, you know, you see Rita Harrington's name and all the promise of her, her, her life. And you see John Caravantes took his own life. And 
like that. That's, and that's, and uh, that's... somebody told me that James Blaze did too. And yeah, you, know, you just sit back. Uh, Michael Reagan died just a couple of years back, and it, you know we're not even in our we're not even at retirement age, and you know, and so even if you're not a sports athlete, life life goes life goes by fast. And you know, we had two people actually who reached out to us. Uh, one of them said because you, you just mentioned it briefly, and I want to mention it briefly because I'm not an expert on it, but mm. somebody said, hey, listen, man, I was at a low point in my life still fighting depression and anxiety. Mm -hmm. And I think, and he said, the kettlebell and the content that you're producing, that's what, that's what kept me alive. And then we have another guy who says he's constantly, constantly battling suicidal thoughts he, he yeah. mentioned this in a session and that you know, you know when you coach people and they say st no, I'm, I'm pretty young still so when you hear stuff like this it immediately goes like oh and you got to stay focused um because it's it's hard to relate because you don't experience i experience of course we all have bad days but when people say stuff like this this really cuts deep mm -hmm. so uh, he just recently shared uh he lost 40 kilos in 11 months 40k 40k 40 kilos and he looks i gotta, I gotta yeah. step my game up. <laughs> he was uh he said he, he did it with some apps with a lot of kettlebell training sure and and he changed he changed he changed he turned the light turned his life around and he showed me uh one of his swing techniques which looks i told angel i was like this makes me so happy because it looks so powerful and I told him, I'm like, wow, that looks great. And, you know, I have this natural tendency to motivate people. And, yeah. But I mean it. I mean it. it. It comes from the bottom of my heart. And, and you know, when people share these stories, it's like, wow. That, that's, that's why I keep pushing. Even Chandler said it in, in the recent podcast. Like, keep helping people. Keep pushing, keep pushing the stuff out. Keep doing yeah. what you do. Because people need it. It's, it's, and my father's 80 plus years old. And, and he's still healthy. He, he does have issues, of course, at his age, but, but he's healthy. And, and when I hear 49, somebody passing away, even though I don't know him, I mean, the kids, yeah. I, remember, I don't even remember when my father was 49, unfortunately. I don't remember it vividly. But I can only imagine what it must feel like if your father snatched out of your life like this. this it's, it's tough stuff. And, yeah. Yeah. That would have been when my that, that for my father would have been 1967. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. He had uh, he had a son in Vietnam. In the war, he had another son just back from Vietnam. Well, you dad, were both in the war. No, no, my brothers. Are your brothers? You, you're the you're the youngest. Mm -hmm. And the number one thing they told me, we don't want you to go to war. Yeah, I had three brothers. I had four brothers. Uh, military, two are disabled. Yeah, that's deep stuff, Dan. I really, yeah. I really. Well, I mean, it keeps me. Uh, yeah, I mean, growing up, you know, growing up with brothers with severe problems, um, and it's funny to say that they wouldn't want to hear that today, but trust me, it was tough. You know, being ten years old, taking care of, you know, it was tough. You know, I look at my. I look at my grandson Danny, and he's he's going into the third grade, and that's when my brother came home from Vietnam. You know, I'm pretty messed up, and I'm thinking. I look at little Danny, and I'm like, man, I just was expected to step up and help out. Right? They're both fine today. They're, they have great careers. Mm -hmm. Life is good, but it was a couple tough years. I'll I'll be frank with you. Yeah, that that's you know, it's so isn't it a stark contrast to the reality that we live in nowadays where everybody feels entitled to everything and everybody's offended about everything yeah and, well you know, back in the day I, i'm too young to experience it but i i mean my father grew up in in second world war i mean he said listen we had it was 1940 he was in yugoslavia so it was like hey, oh, listen, we had yeah. one piece of bread and i think one bottle of milk that's why he always tells me listen you can always so survive with milk and bread that's that, that's what I got from him. What are the what are the beautiful things that he taught me? But it, it's just different. And I, you know, for us younger folks, I think 
um, just having a certain level of appreciation the way things are now and a certain level of gratitude keeps you from from these these dangerous and, and toxic emotions and, and 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 you know philosophies to creep creep inside of you and destroy you from within in, in some cases where I'm yeah and yeah it's this took took a little it took a different Dark. turn then but um it's just always beautiful talking to you dan i'm always it's always a delight i have uh, if you have the time dan i have a couple more things a, i can give you a few more minutes sure but awesome. let's a uh, little bit more rapid fire okay yeah then, rapid fire yeah, then i gotta bounce yeah awesome awesome what is your take on rotational kettlebell exercises stupid it makes no sense to me at all hate it that you can disagree with me anybody mm. and be sure you yeah. keep the whole quote feel free to disagree with me yeah. you're talking to a guy who's been throwing uh active thrower since 1970 trust me you don't want load oh, you yeah. got to be case case of uh, if you don't have your spine locked in if you don't know what you're doing mm. uh and i would just talk call talk get Stu mcgill on the horn and ask him i'm i, I i'm against it 100 percent and that's because I, if you can see the book behind me now, and I can see, show you one book, which I'm really oh, proud it's of. Stu's book, yeah, yeah, <laughs> and I'm I'm getting a hang of it now, and you know the, you mentioned this just a short question, follow up question. Discus thrower means rotational, producing force in rotation. Right. Is that a problem for the spine? Yeah. Yeah, but it's a sport that paid for all my education and all my travel. Wow. So for me, if I have a, like when I was about 19, I had a, I had a real bad lower back injury mm. it, and it led to long-term hamstring issues on the right side, but that's all good. You know, uh, I survived mm. having said that it also paid for my associate's degree, my bachelor's degree, my master's degree, my other yeah. master's degree. Yeah. It sent me around the world. Yeah. So yeah. Do you think it was worth it that those, those injuries were worth it? That's mm -hmm. important. It's the, yeah. it, it, you got to think this through. You, you you mentioned this so many times. This risk to benefit ratio. Yeah. I just recently talked to somebody. We talked about you know soccer players. I don't know what it was, and I was like, listen, or golfers, golfers. Listen, yeah. they destroy their backs, but they get paid millions. Yeah. So they so have what? some benefit. So what, yeah. right? To a certain degree. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have a cousin who played in the National Football League for a long time, and he struggles walking. Well, he's in the Hall of Fame at his university. He's the Hall of Fame at his high school. He makes a living doing this, doing what he loves. Yeah. You know, uh, it's like my, my children, I told them from their youth, I will pay for all your college. And I did. So, you know, when my daughter got her master's degree, I said, how much was it? She gave me a number. I wrote her a check. Why? Cause I threw the discus and my grandkids, my goal, one of my goals is to my legacy to them will be their college education. So, so yeah, was my lower back problem in 1976 worth it? I most, think so. Most definitely. Yeah. And and still, we cannot negate the fact that that it is a problematic situation that yes. most people put there. And I think that's one thing. People put their bodies into these situations that are problematic without any benefits added to it. it right. Whenever I see the people talking about this rotational stuff, I look at them and I look at what they're they're. they're I look at their workshop, their clients, and I'm like, you can get the exact same thing done, what they're doing with hip thrusts and goblet squats at a much safer level and going for a damn walk, hip thrust, goblet squat, and go for a walk. You'll get the exact same benefits. Oh, just, just on, on a side note, because these thoughts keep popping in my mind. Uh, you mentioned the walking. We, we've, we, I mean, you, I use it. I, 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 I aim for 15K a day. So Get we have, out. huh? Really? Yeah, fifteen. I have the gym. I walk four times into the gym and home. I reach. I reach fifteen k most of the time. Yeah, and we have a dog. That's impressive. I, mean, I don't care. Yeah, it's, the, it's, dog, I think two dogs, ten dogs. That's impressive. Yeah, <laughs> it's 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 different. I think uh, you can check out the Apple Health app. Sure, sure, sure. I got where it. it's like, yeah.
It's yeah, beautiful. Yeah, got it. Yeah. That's what I use. But, and, and then I told one of her clients the walking thing. She incorporated it. Then she came back. She's like, oh, my weight stalled. And, you know, we focus on weight loss, so it's all good. I was like, hey, just stay, stay with the habits, the powerful habits that will get you the results. She comes back. She's like, listen, because we talked about walking. And it's so funny when people are like, well, I walk a lot. Then we see the differences. And I'm like, well, it's 4 to 5K. It's, it's great. Maybe shoot for 6 and 7. So she comes back. And she's like, wow, I aimed for 8K, took longer walks, more focused. I, I really kept them in and the weights went down, uh, the, her weight went down. So the walking, I always say it's a calorie incinerator. You never burn as much calories with walking, at, with, with a workout than you can with walking. In fact, I'm doing this thing now. Um, this is me. So I'll do two sets of two in the front squat. Mm -hmm. And then I, I'll, I'll rack the weight on the second set and go that tiny bit I'm, we're, we're talking four front squats mm -hmm. but because it's front squats it's heavy yeah it puts a yeah i i notice the difference in my so i start the front squat breathing i mean the walk i'm breathing which makes me think my heart rate is up i it's already up as i start which means i'm going to get into that fat burning zone which i think exists uh much lower than most uh, people think, but I do think I freed up some free fatty acids. I'm going to eat them up on this walk. Win, 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 win. Mm. And it gives me more front squats. So yeah, <laughs> powerful stuff. Yeah. Powerful stuff there. Well, I really appreciate it. I don't want to take up too much of your time. Maybe we can schedule another one if sure. if you're open to it. I yeah. have one last thing. And sure. um, if I may ask, since you brought it up, because I wrote it down on my list, um, because I'm such a fan of, of, of this book right behind me and because I'm starting to study uh, Dr. McGill's work, maybe do you have any chance where I can reach him and talk to him? So maybe let me ask him. Yeah, oh, that would be awesome. Uh, I will. As soon as I hang up, I'll, I'll ask him. Uh, I'll, I'll ask him. OK, awesome. That's and if awesome. he gives me the yes, I will put you in contact. Sound good? That's that sounds great because I have like a small part of the book is through. And when I open it up, it's almost everything's yellow <laughs> because I, I'm marking so many things. And uh, yeah, I think his best book and uh, for, for someone like myself is The Gift of Injury. So wow. that should be your next book. The Gift of Injury. It's a beautiful. I mean, it's a, and basically he's going to tell you in the book, go for walks. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. a great book. But what's good about it, it's written in more of a, a, a narrative style. Wow. Uh, he, he works with this world-class power lifter, gets him back into shape after a, a really brutal injury. Mm. And what's nice about the book is if you're, if you're kind of wired like I'm wired, where you need to hear the story, like I, I liked, like, for example, if somebody asked me, Dan, why don't you, you used to write about this exercise. Why don't you do it anymore? I mean, I can answer, that's stupid. Or I can tell the whole story about mm. why we added the exercise in the first mm. place, what we thought was happening. Mm. Later, it wasn't working like we mm. hoped. Mm. So we moved on or even better what normally happens. Oh, yeah, we used to do that. But then I got this piece of equipment that does it better, yeah. faster, with less coaching. So that's why we do it. Yeah. But if you don't have this piece of equipment, yeah, do that. Sure, of course. Yeah. Man, but if you have, you know, if you have this equipment or if you have this new tool or if you have this dr drill you don't need to do it anymore mm, great yeah. and that's and just that, um, the gift of injury to me feels well, more like the story about why you do things gotta, gotta check it out the gift of injury yeah. and you know on a, on a last note and maybe i can get your comment on it and steve maxwell actually said um like i said i don't want to stir the pot but it's i think it's interesting for you to know this he said the reason why these folks were injured, all the folks, guys that he named, I don't want to trust, and he specifically mentioned Pavel. He said, I don't want to trust Pavel, a guy who hurt, him, hurt himself as my coach or who experienced injury as my coach. And my initial reaction was somebody who got injured has a lot of experience to tell you, don't go down that route, right? Well, then you'd never have a coach. I mean, really. Right. 
you know, I remember one of the most insightful things I've ever done. So my high school American football coach, you know, American football, where we helmets, you know, we all pad it up. Most definitely. He goes, he walks in, he goes, I'm going to talk about safety today. A couple of things. We have new rules. Okay. Here are the new rules. I'm going to tell you something though. You need for your own, you need to do things like wear a mouthpiece and stuff. And then he went, he pulled it, it went like this. He goes, and he pulls out a whole bunch of his fake teeth and he goes, see, I didn't wear a mouthpiece. Oh no. <laughs> I got to tell you, we had no issues with mouthpieces at South City High <laughs> while he was coach because yeah. when he pulled that thing out and went like you, this. You never forget that, right? Oh no. Damn. Oh, we know when I, uh, so, I mean, if, you know, I mean, I don't want to, so I, st- my, I started lifting weights in 1965. My first trophy comes from 1967. Can you put together a program that starts in 1965 and continues today to today where I would never, ever get injured? Can, can you, can you guarantee me a program? Can, hmm. Now I also have to compete every few weeks. It's, impo- it's impossible. It's oh, wait, what? It's impossible. So I, I have to make every lift on the platform. I can never remember this injury is from trying to break a state record in the snatch. This injury is from all those years of throwing the discus, you know, in snow, rain, bad conditions. Um, my patella tendonitis came from, you know, trying to do, trying to get myself to get a, a division one scholarship. Mm. I mean, okay, so let's just do this. Give me a program that doesn't hurt me. I don't get that division one scholarship. I don't get my degrees. I don't become a teacher and a coach and I'm doing, and I'm doing very well. I'm driving a truck like my family does in South San Francisco. I would have a very happy life right now, but I wouldn't be talking to you on the phone right now. And I was put on this earth to talk to Gregory. (laughs) That's beautiful. (laughs) There, there's your, there's your clip for there's your clip for this show. That's awesome. I'll put this on Instagram on repeat. <laughs> yes. Damn, uh, I highly appreciate it. I, I sure. like I mentioned in the beginning, and you know what you have in in your opening statement, you have just proved one thing again to me, and uh, Jesus said it. Jesus said this: uh, you don't have because you don't ask. Yeah. So asking is crucial, and um, I'm. Uh, you know, and, and one thing, and I, uh, Dan, I've learned so many things from you. But and one thing I have learned, which you might not even be aware of that you taught me this, was I've wrote you an email like this. And what came back was, I think, two or three words. Hey, sounds fine. Let's do it. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I have realized the importance of abbreviations, keeping it short, and you don't have to share your whole story with everybody. It's like, keep it concise and keep it short. And that's what I'm trying to implement because I always, I go down these tan- tangents, but it's like, hey, let's do it. Let's well, do let it. Let me just look, let me just look right now. Since I, I, I cleaned up my emails right before we left. Yeah. Since then I've gotten 14 emails of which probably, yes, half will need responses and the moment i hang up i'm going to send one to Stu and then respond to all those and move on yeah because yeah. that's what i do time efficient yeah well taking care of business Word hey up. listen i've got a roll i've got a um, thank you so much dan yeah. and we'll talk again soon okay yes we'll talk again looking forward and remember i was put on this earth to help you gregory become that's- a better coach that's awesome. I almost all crying. Damn. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, like it. Consider subscribing if you want to see more kettlebell content. And if you're looking for a kettlebell program that builds you up from a beginner to a slowly advanced trainee in the course of about three months, and you maybe want to combine it with some easy to follow nutrition coaching, because maybe you want to lose weight or you want to get in shape, then check out 90 Days of Kettlebells. You'll find the link in the description. 14-day free trial included.